All right. Well, this is Unfragmented, where we're inspired by Colossians 1, 16, and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. On unfragmented, we strive for an unfragmented world. That's why we call this this uh, podcast what it is, unfragmented. We want a cohesive set, uh, set of Christian thoughts. So today is August 30th, 2023. I'm Kevin Novak. Um, really quick, I just want to mention I did put a link to the jurisdiction chart that I mention every now and then. Some One of our listeners was asking about that, so I posted it here in the chat box. And then, of course, I'm joined by Lee Borton, Nicole Parks, Michelle Knapp, and Jennifer Eck, and then Emma Borton is our producer. Um, so this week, we're finishing James Tooley's The Beautiful Tree. It's a wonderful book. And last week, we were joined by Dr. Nick Ellis, who um, helped us discuss certain things, uh, introduced us to these ideas, that is how the generations do not need merely data, but wisdom. Also, how education is really soul formation. We've talked about that here before. And then also, the more layers we add to education and discipleship, the less accountability there is, and the less parents are really governing. And of course, you can go to Lee Borton's YouTube channel to watch the archive shows. And this week, if you don't mind, I'll ask a question to start off. One of the things that I was realizing, and I, I think I knew this somewhat before, I don't know that I really, it was solidified in my, in my brain, but as I was reading the middle towards the end of the book, and if, you know, this week we want to talk, if we can, a little more about solutions going forward, but it it dawned on me how we're reading this book about education, but to me, this book is really about capitalism and economics. And, and I, I, I think in my brain, I somehow connected those two, but I don't know that I really um, had that solid thought, that expressed thought, like, hey, this book is really about um, the intersection of education capitalism and we've talked about accountability so anyone have you did you did anyone already have that thought and how do we explain to other people that there is that intersection we're talking here about accountability education capitalism but also that that's okay because as we've talked about before when we start talking about profit and education oh and, and I see uh, really quick Dr. Nick Ellis has joined us um, I'm asking a question right now, and then Michelle has a question for you, Dr. Ellis. So thank you for coming back. Um, and I just want to get everyone's thoughts there on, on what I had mentioned, that is this intersection between um, education and, and capitalism. I mean, I think they can never be mutually exclusive. Somebody has to pay the bills for the education. And so... Um, and that capitalism, which, you know, George Gilder so good at saying is from the, the Latin for kaput, it's thinking at your head, uh, the same word that, so it's, it's just, to me, everything is about follow the money, like I'm a Rush Limbaugh fan, and if you don't know where the money's coming from, or if you didn't, put it this way, if you don't know the money came from you, it means it came from somebody else, and therefore it's either welfare or charity, and whether it's for food or for housing or for education or for, you know, trips on airplanes, it doesn't matter what it is. And so if you didn't pay for it, you should wonder who had to sacrifice so that you could have what you have. Lee, I'd like to ask you, because I was talking to someone at church the other day about this. How do you address that issue of it seems to be taboo to be running a school, but doing it? for profits. How, how do you address that when someone talks about that as somehow being evil or the, having the wrong motive? Well, Classical Conversations is a for-profit, and I'm proud that it's a for-profit because a for, the difference between a for-profit and a non-profit is non-profits um, customers the donor. For-profits customers the person they serve. 
And I didn't want education to have to be around um, other people deciding what we should or shouldn't do because they gave us the dollars. The parent gets to decide when they pay for it. So the customer and the um, teacher, in our case, has ultimate responsibility to one another and accountability to one another. So I think it's a good thing for it to be for profit. I don't know why anybody would think otherwise. And I just was reading 2 Corinthians. I'm going to have to look it up again. I sent it to myself. But um, it's when Paul's speaking to the one of the um, churches and he says, look, I'm here because the, because the church in Macedonia paid for me to be here. You didn't. I'm robbing from them in order to serve you. He understood that if you were shirking your duty and not paying your own bills, somebody else was going to um, have some sort of lack because of it. Mm -hmm. It's all through scripture. Jesus grabbing Matthew by the collar. And, uh, and I mean, in Matthew, Jesus grabbing Peter by the, by the collar and jerking him into the room and saying, what do you mean the king's son pays taxes? What are you talking about? Right. It's all through scriptures. So I still know where this idea from the church came that it should be everything should be free. I get pretty well, worked up about it, so I don't know. I do, I, know. <laughs> I do too. Well, you know, the, the, this maybe this sounds obvious to everyone, but then of course, you know, you have whomever. We see this with the civil government system, school system. Whomever is paying your salary, you're going to be beholden to those people. Uh, but but if your salary is coming from the parents directly, or even the school indirectly, which is still there's still some a nexus there between the the teacher and the and the parent and the child, then there there's going to be a different dynamic there. You're, Nicole, I see you're nodding your head. What do you what do you think about that? Um, um yeah. Well, I was just thinking about recently having a conversation with my sister in law. She's um, she's an art teacher at a charter school and we know charter schools are mostly publicly funding, but there also is some private money involved in well. And it was just making me thinking, you know, if, I mean, it's not a true free market situation because the government's still involved, but she was recently telling me about how, um, previously she had some say in what money could be spent for her art supplies. And now that somebody who doesn't know anything about art is having full control of the money and is just buying things that she does not see being able to use and benefit the needs of her students. Like, she's like, what am I going to do with this like 3D printing machine or, or you know, something like that? Um, you know, so that's just kind of was just something that was just popping in my head if we're talking about the market and education and how things are spent versus what, you know, maybe the consumer would want versus what somebody higher up thinks the consumer wants, which I think we see that in the beautiful tree as well. I want to know, I didn't get to finish the last chapter. I'm actually in the point where he's suggesting um, vouchers be the solution but then he starts to give some reasons against it. Does he in the end want vouchers or does he talk himself out? Of Targeted vouchers Jennifer, is what he called them. Yeah, Jennifer, do you, did you happen to get through the ending? I did not make it through the ending. So I'm curious to know as well. <laughs> We're all at that same part. I couldn't get past it because <laughs> I kept going back to reread it going, surely you didn't pay attention to the last nine chapters you wrote. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really. Yeah, I think it's worth I think it's worth asking the question because I, in the, in the last chapter you you know you see him e evaluating it, full vouchers, universal vouchers, targeted vouchers, and I don't know that he actually does land the plane. I think that he, you know, he's asking the question: um, Is there a role for this? Is there a use for this? Is there a way to take advantage of this? If there is. Uh, you know, market incentive, if there is um, choice of the, of the consumer, you know, and those kind of things, is there a way to balance this out? And so I actually think we should just take that particular bull by the horns here and ask the questions. Cause I don't think he, I don't think he's, he has an answer for us, honestly, at this point. And he doesn't have an answer, certainly doesn't have an answer for the poor, the very poor communities. He definitely did not land the plane when it comes to, to, to the West. And to the uh, 
to, to the U.S. And so, well, yeah. The other thing about like the whole time reading the books, I was thinking this book would not be very effective in our culture. Just like um, the cultures he visited, people would say, but we don't have private schools. Our country would say, well, we already have private schools. And they would say, we don't use bribes. It's not a cultural thing in our country. So we wouldn't have the problems that they have. Okay, So I can see a lot of people refuting um, uh, the negative points that he has about the public intervention in the private schools here in, in the United States. But the difference is that in the, to me, in, in their countries, the bribes between somebody you want to give the bribe to Versus our bribe is um, tax deductions, tax credits, uh, universal basic education, uh, universal highways. Like we have so many ways we are bribed by the government to accept their power and authority that we don't even recognize them. And because they do it on a one by one basis, it feels different because um, like Thomas Jefferson said, we will suffer, we, uh, we will suffer a lot of evils until they become unsufferable so as long as we feel like we're getting something for that money we don't complain even though it is a bribe so that's one context i think that's really difficult about this book and passing it on to other people um but the question that you're asking nick i know this, i didn't answer that at all but i just wanted to point that out. i still think this is a really difficult book to to share with like cc parents or the parents that i talk to because they would say this doesn't happen here mm -hmm. yeah well i do think that uh, having to recontextualize re it to um, less honest bribing, because I'd say that it's it's less honest. <laughs> they're bribing internationally, but at least they're honest about their bribing. They're just simply like, you pay us or we're not going to approve your school, full stop. Mm -hmm. Here it's, we're going to surround all of these layers of teacher unions. And no, we're not going to allow you you know, to open up this particular school unless you do this and this and this and this. And it's couched in a very, very different type of control, but the control is still there, you know? And so I think what we have to do is we have to take a step back and say, okay, what is keeping us from having the freedom that, and self-governance that we actually want to see here? What are, what are the layers of control and third-party governance that is keeping us from being able to say, yes, I can educate the way that I want, Yes, I can pull other people around around us. Yes, I want full control, and you have no right in the space. What what, what are the codes, layers? Of the building codes, zoning codes, fire mm -hmm. codes, minimum wage laws, um, uh, HR department benefits and regulations. Oh, those buildings. Those are all the things that make what should be super inexpensive really expensive. And when he was talking about in the 18, when Tooley was talking about in the 1850s, the report he found where a teacher fired all the, um, where a headmaster fired all the teachers after he discovered the school children themselves were better teachers to the students. And he hired the boys to become teachers. I was like, that's right. That's exactly the American colonial way of education. It was part time. It was small. And the 15 and 16 year olds taught the six, seven, eight, and nine year olds because all they were teaching was them how to read, write, and do arithmetic, which everybody and anybody should be able to do with very, very little cost. So we have to get rid of government regulations as well as cultural issues. There's, it's so huge, this problem worldwide. Yeah so, yeah, so just take, you know, well, actually two Arlingtons, tale of two Arlingtons if you want, you know, take Arlington, Virginia. I think they're at 810 million this year is Arlington, Virginia ISDs. Um, their their school district budget this year. Um, Arlington, Texas, I think they're at 670 million. Um, and you you start to peel back that money and you start to think about how much is being sent, uh, you know, siphoned away. And you know, it's just it's just an, an unbelievable amount of resources um, that have been basically picked from people's pockets with no recourse. So then I think that's where, if we can shed light on it, I think it's helpful because if people in, you know, the colonial era were doing this with virtually no resources, um, you know, here we have, you know, almost, almost a billion dollars for, a, for a, for a county, mm -hmm. not, no, not, not even a county, sorry, Arlington ISD, not even a that's county sick. for, for a town within Tarrant County, mm -hmm. a billion dollars. And that's where I think if you start to really just elevate the information, um, people just have no idea 
about the, the just the sheer amount of waste that's involved because it's hidden. Like nobody wants to talk about it. You know, all of these layers of corruption, all of these layers of people getting paid. Nobody wants to talk about it because if people know about it, suddenly it's like, what can we do with those resources? So I do think that there is a certain amount of just PR and information that we can bring to the table that will do a lot of good. But Nick, how do you do that when there's 67% of all money earned right now by the American populace is actually from government monies, whether it's mm -hmm. printed fiat or tax dollars? Sure. Nobody wants to get rid of their own job. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's challenging. But I also think that, you know, when people just look at the sheer amount of waste, and especially when you tie this to things like, well, in Texas, it's different because all of this is paid out of our um this is paid out of our, our land tax, right? This is paid out of our um, uh, property tax. And now with property taxes skyrocketing, we're all looking around and saying, how did I just how did I just quadruple my property tax in the last year? And where does that go? Well, 80% of that goes to public public school. Well, wait a minute, that's money out of my pocket that I actually that I am I getting use of that? So so I do think that just looking at the economics and shedding light on it at least will help. Because nobody wants to pay more taxes on their house, especially when it's going towards something that is just as ineffective and expensive as the public system. And I think that then if you can say something like, well, hey, here's here's our group of classical conversation kids that are paying, you know, X amount a year. And here's the results. And here's the, you know, here, here are the the outcomes and the outputs. And you had zero, the, those kids, the education of those kids had zero impact on your dollar, on, on your on your wallet as a, as a public person. Why, why wouldn't you want more of that? You know, you're, you're very concerned about, you know, universal education and all those kind of things. Well, here's a bunch of kids that have tremendous outcomes and they cost you nothing as a, as a taxpayer. Why wouldn't you want to do more of that? So, so I do think that there's just some really good, because it's not just public, private schools. I mean, there's so many options out there with such great outcomes. So they do see what we're doing, Nick, and they want to copy it, and they being our Republican conservative friends. So they've decided we're the government and we're here to help. And now they're offering all those ESAs and vouchers because they think they can replicate classical education without it being Christian or, or community-based. They think it still can be bureaucratic, secular-based. That's what DeSantos, Larry Arn, all the big names in education think there's a way to do it without the family being the one in charge and the, what you talked about the other day, parental governance. So they're paying attention. They see what we're doing, but they don't know, understand you can't replicate it, that the form matters as much as the content and they want just the content to matter. Right. No, I, I agree with that. So then mm -hmm. I guess the question is, is, is the enemy of my enemy, my friend on this thing? Yeah. I think the Democrats became our friends during COVID but your other point though about the money, so I talk to legislators all the time, classical conversations all by itself, just classical conversations saves the U.S. government 13, or the taxpayers across the United States, $13 billion in, right. in student expenditures. And I tell right. them that and they're blown away. And then I'm like, and then we are one organization. There's hundreds of people yeah. doing what we do. Yeah. Um, they and I don't know what's right. going on. Yeah. And I think that was my point, uh, actually, the, my original point of if you can show them, here's how much these children cost to educate. Here's how much it costs you to educate these children with massively greater outputs, um, social and, and academic. Um, mm -hmm. I really think it's starting to become a little bit of a, of a PR game, because if we can if we can say, here's 30 billion dollars that we kept in your pocket and that's one organization. We need more organizations like this. We need more growth like this, you know? And so I, I, I do think that just continuing to show to the public, you know, this is enormous benefit and all the PR right now is teachers, public schools, all, all of this push and pressure, you know, vouchers, all this other kind of stuff. And instead to be able to say, well, actually these cost you nothing. This wasn't even, this wasn't even kind of, didn't even count, count, count this didn't even cost you the voucher amount. This cost you nothing. And look at the look at the social benefit that we've been able to show. So I, I do think that there's some 
there are some ways of beginning to make some pretty significant waves on this thing. Um, I don't know if we have enough organizations, and I'll, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say this, Lee, possibly to your chagrin, um, we need more organizations like Classical Conversations because for universal coverage, we have to be, I compare this to the organic food movement um, back in the 80s and 90s. It's like, you know, on the one hand, maybe we don't want to all eat Monsanto-based food and not be able to plant our sterile seeds and grow our own crops. Like maybe there's a problem with the whole food issue, you know? And so we start to think about this and say, well, how do we start to go quote unquote organic? And this isn't going to be a debate about the good or the bad of organic. It's just an example. Well, you need two things. You need both organic farms in Nebraska and Vermont actually going out and doing the work. And you also need a by certified organic push that says, hey, these people are out there. You don't just have to go buy your standard Monsanto food groups. This is out there. Go buy organic. Well, if you only have the brand and the push, but you don't have the farmers, it doesn't do any good because I can't buy organic food at my local farmer's market. But if I'm a lone single farmer out in the middle of Vermont trying to grow you know, food without pesticides and nobody knows I'm even there, then the movement doesn't start. And I think that what Classical Conversations has done is it's given us an example of that you know, organic farmer, that this is viable, it's real. Is there a space for other people to come along and say, wow, we really need to push on this for maximum growth? Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to have these false alternatives like the voucher systems come in and say, hey, we're going to fill that vacuum. Um, and so it just makes me wonder about, is there, a, is there a place for this kind of parentally governed push that says, here's the benefits, here's the cost savings, here's what we've done, here's our academic outcomes. And I feel like we've done that kind of sort of well in what I would call homeschooling, but I don't know if we've done that terribly well in terms of the overarching parental governance kind of approach that says homeschool, private school, pod, classical conversation style, parental governance allows us to have massive push and sway with tremendous social benefits and therefore maybe consider buying organic. Um, so yeah. those are just so I spent, that, but so you don't know this because it didn't get anywhere, but I, for six months was on um, different TV and radio stations four days a week for about, about four hours in, in any given week, you know, and it was like, you couldn't schedule it. You never knew when the interviewer was going to want you with the message that everyone can't homeschool, but we need micro schools. So we need cottage schools, we need community schools. The people I talked to said, I'd never heard of any of these. I'm like, where were you during COVID? They all sprung up then. Like people don't pay attention to what's going on because classical conversations, or it's back up, Lee Bortons doesn't want anybody in public school. In order for that to happen, we have to have thousands of classical conversations and thousands of private schools. And so I've been doing everything I can to show people that that's what we need. Um, and then there's one change that's been very positive. Five, four or five years ago, whenever I was on tour, some of our leaders would be discouraged because people would leave challenge two, three, four to go to public school. Parents would get afraid, less involved. And now they get upset by the leaders because they've left classical conversations to go to another private option. And I'm like, girls, that is the best news I've ever heard. We mm -hmm. need one another to do this. Yep. The thing is the um, the Betsy DeVosses of the world and the you know Fox News and all them, they won't give us traction on this message, no matter how hard we've worked. We finally next week might have a buy-in. Robert has finally been asked to be on the Laura Ingram show to talk about this, but they don't want to hear this message. They want to hear vouchers. Yeah. Well, it, the, in the book, they actually made this point about, you know, the, some of the benefit of the franchise model, which is kind of what you work in, Lee. Um, and if you think about the franchise model, especially if you give local parental governance within that franchise model, you know, the best thing that ever happened to the franchise model is there are multiple franchises. Mm -hmm. Because now it's not just, well, there's only McDonald's. Suddenly you've got Chick-fil-A. 
And now it becomes standardized to say, well, you know what? I, I don't love hamburgers, so let's eat more chicken. But the ability to replicate the model, the franchise model, um, actually feeds off each other, which is why you see all these franchises kind of cluster around each other. You know, be, and so I wonder if there's not a, if there's almost not an association uh, that needs to be created that pushes on these and says to entrepreneurs, you know, here's a great model with classical conversations, but there's, I mean, what what, what do you have, uh, Lee? Uh, maybe like 120,000 families at this point. Is yeah, we have right? almost 3,000 communities now with 50,000 yeah. families. Right. And so, great. We need about another 200 million. Three, 200 million. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a scarcity model. <laughs> the, the, the scarcity is in the application of the model. It's not, it, it's not a scarcity of market. And so that makes me start to think through, because again, it does come back to, to capitalism and questions of socialism versus capitalism. And I wonder if, if we're not, maybe, if maybe we're not playing the wrong game on this, mm -hmm. that ultimately we need more people like Lee Bortons. We need more brand market out there, more market awareness to actually elevate the entire conversation around this and then say, you know, suddenly more people are aware of classical conversations and more people buy into this model because the model is actually becoming mainstreamed. Um, I think the best thing that ever happened to MediShare in a very similar kind of thing, but in the medical space, is suddenly you have multiple. I think the, the, the creation of the, um, what is it, Samaritans. I think the creation of Samaritans Ministries was the best thing that ever happened for MediShare because it validated the model because now you have different kind of competing spaces and suddenly MediShare went from a $100 million company to a $300 million company with the introduction of additional shared models in, in the marketplace. Yeah. So anyways, these are just riffing on how do you take this idea and fill the gap that right now the voucher kind of uh, parent choice option is filling instead of the parental governance model, which should really be filling the space that are kind of two different things. Um, well, one of the problems is the folks who should be on our side on this and are starting these programs, they're out there, Nick. They're starting to grow them. And every one of them is doing it because they can get the government to finance their homeschool one day a week right. or two day a week community program. Yep. Right. They're, they're proliferating. And so they're sucking up all the customers, the dollars and the leadership because of the bribery that's going on. And that hurts our local communities or temporarily. It's always been temporary, no matter what movement it's been, because people eventually see what's really going on if they're Christians and they they go back to knowing God and making them known. But those dollars right now are really hard for them to mm -hmm. not turn away. Yep. So, yep. Uh, One of the things that I saw when I um, read, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, I think it was a guy named Hagedorn. He had written a book about the development of the uh, public school system. I mentioned it before. I think it was, I think it's called Founding Zealots. And there were, there were different movements that helped develop the civil government school system, different waves, different movements, cultural, political, spending, taxation. You had all these different parts. And when we talk about eventually just having private education, education freedom in America, I think it's going to be all the things that we're talking about here. Even other movements will have overlap. I mean, the problem right now is we, we have, are having to teach our younger people that capitalism is biblical and socialism is not. But then we have to wait 30 or 40 years for them to be in positions of authority and power. And so I, I see all these things um, that we, you and Nick and, and, and all of us are proposing. I, I'm not saying you're proposing it's a silver bullet. I know you weren't saying that, but it's all these things. The Lyceum movement was big too in the early, well, I think it was more like the mid 1800s, you know, and that really helped the development of, of liberalism and humanism. And, and that, yeah. of course, 
bled over in the civil government school system though. So we see all well, these you know, things. The Lyceum movement different. started off as a private organization and it was so successful that the, the same version happened. The government came in and said, hey, we're here to help. Here's some money. And it was the beginning. <laughs> the Lyceum movement schools were the beginning of the public schools in our country. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, and, that, and that's good. Thank you for clarifying it. But it's just, it's all these things. And I think we are, I, I think that I'm actually a part of Samaritan Ministries, and I, I think that to me is just recapturing freedom. I love it. You know, I love it. And, and I think there are people in different ways beginning to uh, recapture. But of course, you know, it is difficult, like you're saying, Lee, where we're having to reject in the short term these dollars and people are, aren't just wanting to do it because it's too hard. So at, at, at some point, there's going to be... Uh, you know, a, a whatever, I don't know what the biblical, well, I guess a uh, uh, tipping point where, you know, there, there's going to be this heavy uh, uh, meeting between what we're doing and what the civil government wants to do. But we've seen with COVID, as we've talked about many times, where there's been an additional wave of development um, in pushing civil government schools. And you've got other industries too that are reliant on the civil government school system, you know, bookmaking, the publishing and all that. So you've got, and you've got unions, of course. So it's just going to, over time, require changes in thinking more, more broadly with freedom. Um, and the other thing I want to add r really quick is that, you know, with the elite spending money on education, you know, Dr. Ellis, you had talked last week about, uh, and I think if you use the term soul formation and talking about education, but it, I don't know that the elites are ever going to be convinced that that's really what education and discipleship are about. And we have to get more people comfortable with the idea that it's okay if your child is 10 and they don't know how to use a computer. That's okay. But can they have a, a discussion about Anne of Green Gables or Ben-Hur or, or some other classics? Like, can they do that? And, and so that, that's another component, just trying to get reteach people like we are just cultivating the soul. We're just trying to get them to be joyful, to lead them to Jesus and, and, and walk in his ways. It's not about uh, you being a cog in a wheel and being able to use a smartphone and a computer. Yeah. So um, can I get back to Lee's original question about did um, Thule have any um, plans or uh, any conclusions as to um, what we should be doing. And on page 247, right, it's the towards the end of the biggest paragraph in the book. Um, it starts out with rather than, no, you can, wait, hold on. The, 247. Right. Okay. Yeah, page 247. Um, I'd say right where it says you can relax. Um, you can relax. Your author has no such delusions of grandeur. All the hoopla about having the right plan is itself a symptom of the misdirected approach. The right plan is to have no plan. Agreed. Rather than a new big plan, I want to point to the general ways in which we can alert or which we can start small and work our way up. And by, by we, I mean thousands of small-scale philanthropic and aid agency projects working hand-in-hand -hand with thousands of small-scale educational entrepreneurs trying different approaches, building on what works and rejecting or modifying what doesn't. So many uh, little bits of information are out there in the market known only to parents, children, and entrepreneurs that can move the solutions forward. So many different levels of uh, incentives for parents, children, and entrepreneurs, oops, did I read that twice, can be harnessed to make the solutions work. We don't need an overreaching plan, overarching plan at all. But here are some uh, pointers to what might work, and then he goes on. And I think that's where I oh, just about browser. stopped. Yeah. yeah. Central, so, central planning doesn't work. Yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. Central planning has never worked. It would never yeah. work with food production. <laughs> it would never work with the restaurant franchise. It doesn't work. 
And so let the market have its hand. Because I really agree that if you open up the space for thousands of entrepreneurs to learn from best practices, they fill the gaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whenever COVID occurred, you guys don't know this, I don't think, but I ran a micro school and for two years over at our uh, gym at the NAV, I hired one mom who hired a whole bunch of 15 year olds and they helped a few dozen public school kids whose parents were all at the hospital working full time during COVID. And uh, we ran a little classical conversation in school for two years. But as soon as the schools were opened up again, I knew that because I was breaking zoning laws and I was breaking hiring laws, that the government who knew, my local government knew what I was doing. I'm friends with them. I live in a small town. But I knew as soon as the schools were open, they would come after me if I kept it up. So we closed it down because my battle isn't to create micro schools. I applaud people who do it. My battle is to help more families recover their responsibility as Christians and homeschoolers. Um, and so when doing that, I just, I met in my tours during that time, hundreds of pa pastors in inner cities whose, whose wives had started micro schools. Most of them had to shut down when COVID started. So we, we think it's this government plan to, you know, get us for all kinds of like obvious reasons, but it isn't. It's again, it's fire codes and hiring laws that make mm -hmm. it so that we can't be entrepreneurial. Yeah. And coming from California and the ways that the government, the legislatures were trying to annihilate the rights of private homeschoolers, which believe it or not, as liberal as that state is, the homeschoolers really up until the, recently just could pretty much do as they pleased. We weren't going to have, we didn't have to have um, statewide testing. We did not have to be under an umbrella. We didn't have to turn in work. We didn't have to file affidavits with our local school district. We didn't have to have um, a, a an accredited teacher um, tr checking our students' work. Um, but how they were trying to get around it was by enacting fire code laws and saying that the local fire chiefs were going to have to come into our homes and inspect to make certain that we were under fire code when we all knew behind the scenes what they were really trying to do was come in and make certain that we weren't abusing our kids mm -hmm. um and so anyway i don't know how i got on that diatribe yeah. No, well, um, same thing as me. So I have a question there from Nicole or Jennifer. So Prager U just made big announcements. They're supposedly a conservative pro-American organization. They just made big announcements that both the state of Florida and Texas are now public schools are going to now be using their curriculum and they're going to be getting all those tax dollars for the public schools. Part of that, I mean, for their <laughs> public school material. Part of what Kevin was referring to is those industries that support the public school. So what do you think about it when conservative organizations go after the public-private partnerships? Are they smarter than me? Well, it's either, it could either be the two things. It could be that there's a profit motive there um that they see there's a there's a market and there's a need because of the people the, the conservatives that are in the civil government schools are desiring and wanting these things so there's a market for it yes um it's kind of that's kind of would be the main thing that i would see is that mm -hmm. there's a desire and a market yeah. for it um just like so where i live you know i, I do live um in a you know, it would be considered a red county in Texas. And um, a lot of people that are, you know, Christians in the schools and, um, you know, people think it's a really big deal that the superintendent of the school district that I'm in isn't a Christian. And that gives a lot of false hope in in people in my community that they think, yes, our schools are, you know, we're, we're the good schools. We're not as because our superintendent is a is a Christian, and and he and he from all intents and purposes that I know about him is he is you know he is a good he's a good man, but the market's yep. there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what you just said is just right. They're they're answering the market of the conservative Christians. Um. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's too bad. I saw that today, and it's 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 disappointing. But um, you know, I, if I called them, I don't know that they would take my call on that one. But <laughs> not when they're getting a billion dollars in uh, revenue. No, oh my <sighs> no, it's too bad. Well, but and it's no to me, it's no different than when the Chinese came in and started buying up the private schools in Florida so that they could get the money that followed the child. So it's going to Chinese multinationals, not to mom and pop who were putting together this uh, right plan that has no plan and having a thousand mm -hmm. little doors do it. I'm reading what Michelle just read. So, so I, I wonder if I could remain hopeful to say, or optimistic to say, maybe they just don't realize what it is that they're doing. Do you think? You know what I mean? It's like, they're just not... It's that long-term vision. Who was it that we read? It said they're looking at the now, but they're not thinking about the effect that it's going to have farther down the road. Mm -hmm. I, I think know. that's true. Yeah, we've got we've got just about five minutes left, and if you don't mind, everyone, I know maybe some of this will be a little obvious, um, and some of us are familiar with with the you know the, our lifestyles and what the others are doing but maybe we could just take a few minutes and talk about some ideas uh with how we can move the ball forward uh maybe individually too like michelle maybe you can uh, go first and share with us some of the things you've been doing to move the ball forward with uh private education and then maybe there are some ideas that you have that others can maybe uh, pick up the ball and, and do something with or, or help them that's something they've never thought of. Well, hearing you guys talk, there's just been so many things going through my mind right now. But one of the things that I thought about as I was reading this book, and in fact, um, I even put it down here, I was wondering to myself if there are hidden private schools in the United States that are in the poor communities that we just don't know about. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about is what could I do to get classical conversations into poor communities where before I were to do that is to work with the local churches that could help offset the costs for the families that couldn't wouldn't necessarily be able to afford um, the tuition or the books. So, you know, reaching out to the churches saying, hey, this is what we can do for your community. And what can you do to help the parents and yes, we are a for-profit company, but that is because we don't operate under the government and we are about um, those entrepreneurial offering the uh, a product that you, you have parental guidance. So you, the parents are involved and they are the ones that are having control over their students' education. Yeah, that's good. I, I will say, I think poorer areas, that is such, uh, I hate to call it a market, but I'm just saying like uh, there's a potential for that type of demographic in those people because they, I think like Dr. Ellis was talking about last week, where a lot of those are immigrant families and there's still people that believe in, in the generations where having grandparents around is a big deal. And so they're they're ripe for that type of um, uh, maybe education. I, I personally have wanted to just, this is somewhat from my experience in doing inner city homeless outreach. I've wanted to just, I haven't had the time to do it, but just go to downtown Fort Worth and start going door to door and just talking to people about homeschooling and so on. Um, really quick, I wanted to ask Jennifer too about some ideas, but I also want to just quickly say and I'm not advertising here, but one of the solutions we've come up with, and Joel Parks, Nicole's husband, 
as part of our committee where we just started a scholarship committee. So hopefully that will have legs. I'm confident in it. There's, you don't need a lot of money to do it. And it's, it's pretty simple. And, the, and Michelle, I was thinking about, I'm not saying you need to do this, but that was something that I thought of when you're talking about helping people. And what I like about the scholarship committee is I don't, there are no gatekeepers to it. No one, no one could tell me no. I don't have to ask anyone's permission to do it. I just did it. And thankfully, the people I asked, the men that I asked to be on the committee, they said yes. And now we're doing it. So anyway, I, you, um, that's well, one thing yeah. I'm doing. I'm glad to hear that, Kevin. If you go to givesendgo.com forward slash classical conversations, there's about $30,000 there waiting to donate to you. Okay. So I put to, I put together a nonprofit webpage in order for people to make donations to folks like you guys. That's great. That's great. And then Jennifer um, and then Nicole, do you mind just uh, sharing with us maybe something you do maybe something we don't know about and maybe an idea that you have that maybe can help us with Christian education. Well, um, I think that a lot of what I'm hearing in, in a lot of our conversation tonight uh, has a lot to, to do with what Michelle was saying. I was, that's exactly what I was thinking is the short-term vision versus the long-term vision. And I I don't know if I have an answer for how to help our families um, in in our communities and in our wider communities in our towns to see that long term vision. Um, but I think we do see um, I think like you had mentioned, Lee, in those upper years, uh, families getting nervous sometimes pulling out um, like Dr. Ellis had mentioned last week you know, this push to graduate early and to get to colleges early um, instead of slowing down and taking maybe an extra year or taking extra time um, or staying home in those really formative years when they're 18 and 19 and when they're, you know, beginning to make some, you know, very impactful choices. And I would like to help our families all see that long-term vision uh, it's something I'm still wrestling with and working towards. One thing, it's a small thing. I don't know how much it impacts that, but um, one of the costs that goes along with educating uh, in a classical conversations community is books. And um, I know a lot of our families here work really hard to have the tuition. And so... Um, we are a very small community also where we'll have like one student in challenge A this year. And then, you know, that's it, just the one, right? And then after they're done with challenge A, maybe they're done with some of the novels that we have read. And so I'm slowly trying to work towards maybe having like a set of books that a challenge A family could borrow for a year. And that helps to alleviate, you know, that mm. little bit of a cost it makes it just maybe a little bit easier for them to say yes to that year rather than, you know, making another choice. And if I can build up a, it's, it's just in the beginning, you know, but if I could build up a library where there's a set that could be checked out for each of those upper levels, you know, that a family could borrow for a year and it could make it easier for even just one family each year to say yes to keeping their child home and being in charge of their child's education rather than sending them off. Um, I don't know if that's a hope. And, also, mm -hmm. I just really love books and I'm passionate about books. So that's uh, an area <laughs> where I'm passionate. Well, Jennifer, send, send, right. yeah, send right. me a list and I'll look at our do not inventory shelf and send you some free ones to just throw into your library. And see, look at that. What a great idea because you're going to start a public lending library. Mm -hmm. We've talked about there shouldn't yeah. be public libraries yeah. either. They should all be private yeah. libraries. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, we need private libraries. So, yeah, that's great. And then, Nicole, do you have something? I know oh, we're we're short on time here, but do you did you want to share some? Did you, did you want to share some ideas, Nicole? Uh, I was just gonna say real quick. It was so funny. Like right before, um, when my husband and I were having dinner, we were actually uh throwing back ideas of how we could actually open up a homeschooling bookstore because there's the one that's um in Louisville that's closing at the end of the month. And we were just thinking, man, if we could have the money right now, which we only have a little bit in, you know, some savings of like 
having a homeschooling bookstore to continue to get that um, out there, more resources for people and things like that, because it is, it is a growing market. And I think there is a need for that. And just like all the ideas that could go behind having like, you know, another resource in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm thankful for Lee and, and Nick and all that they do because mm-hmm. they're able to, you know, not all of us are able to um, run organizations or have those gifts. And I think, you know, if, if, as long as we can all contribute or part of uh, classical conversation, and then of course, some of the things Dr. Ellis does, you know, we, we support. Um, and Dr. Ellis, do you mind just briefly um, reminding us about your organization and what you do and then where people can go to, to, to read about it. Yeah, well, you can check out christianhalls.org, christianhalls.org. And, um, you know, really the way we set that up, to kind of your point on how do you, what are some of the ideas? You know, we are on the one hand, very committed to that local owned and operated uh, learning community. You know, that we're very, very committed to that. And the vast majority of our uh, learning campuses, um, they're not our learning campuses, they're, the, they're, they're locally owned and operated. The campuses that we serve are, uh, are run as LLCs. They're easy to set up, they're tutor led, they take advantage of our university partners that we have agreements with. But we set up Christian Halls International as a nonprofit, really as, a, as an association to push that idea. And so, I think finding ways of working together through like associations that can be out there pushing the bioorganic idea and pushing it across the public sphere without making the mistake, to Lee's point, of trying to make all of these local options, you know, somehow uh, nonprofit or, you know, zero profit motive or even worse, aggregated into some, some sort of central planning. And if we can come together and say, here are the groups of us, you know, Lee Bortons, Nick Ellis, many, many other people out there that are saying there's a different way to do this. Now, here's some options. Here are some opportunities in the marketplace. Go find the one that's the best fit for your family. Take back responsibility, self-govern for the best. You, you know what's best for your kids. And here's the marketplace of, of options. And I think that unfortunately in the U.S., we're still a little too immature and a little too young to have kind of developed those kinds of uh, kind of shared associations of the, 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 the line around these missions. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create both locally owned and operated micro campuses in the higher education space um, that can function on a profit motive, that can pay their people well, that can be entrepreneurial. And we're also trying to create a shared sense of, yes, you can do this. Yes, this is possible. Go to market. And so th- that's how we're trying to use both sides of that um, that equation, that for-profit, non-profit equation. Um, we may be, uh, we may be wrong in doing that. I'm not sure yet. Um, but that's, that's how we're using kind of both tools in our toolbox to go grow and expand. Oh, right. I think you're doing a good job, Nick. I mean, I only applaud you and I'm so glad that I got to meet you and your mom and you guys may not know he's referred to his mom a couple of times, but Diane is who um, runs Brazil for Glasgow conversations. Yeah. So we're, we've known each other for a while and she raised a good boy. Him and Robert are similar ages, <laughs> my son. So, and I, and the first right. minute I met his mother was here in the States. Um, uh, it's like we were instantly kindred spirits because we'd start talking about freedom immediately and no one else had ever, you know, really embraced it like we had. And that was, you know, a <laughs> dozen years ago or 10 years ago or so. Now we got lots of oh, friends. That's right. That's right. Shared, right. shared roots with lots of different trees that are growing out of it, which is great. No. All right, Michelle, okay, well, do you want I, to... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Wait, I just want to also tell you, James Tooley is actually speaking in D.C. next in two weeks, and one of our legislative staff members is going up there to try to talk to him to see what he really thinks about things, because this book's old. It's 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and so he may have really changed his mind or he might be a troublemaker. I don't know. We'll ah, find out. Is he going to be at is the Cato Institute where he'll be? It's a D.C. Um, conference on uh, free market education, but it's being handled by a bunch of voucher people. So I'm tentative about what's going to happen. Yeah. OK, Michelle, do you want to do your your thing? And then actually, I'm going to ask Dr. 
Dr. Ellis to pray for us, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So if you've enjoyed tonight's um, episode, would you please do us a favor and hit the like and subscribe button so that we can start reaching more um, friends and persons of peace out there. And um, we just hope you're enjoying what it is that um, we have been discussing. Great. Dr. Ellis, you mind closing in some prayer, sir? I'd be privileged to. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this group of thinkers, entrepreneurs, mothers, fathers, people who care first and foremost about the formation of the next generation. Lord, I pray that we would have wisdom. There's a lot of things out there that distract us from the goal. Uh, I pray that we would not exchange um, shackles for shackles, that we would not turn to solutions that ultimately lead to bondage but that we would be courageous, that we'd have the, 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 more, the moral and spiritual courage to press toward the goods uh, for our children and for the next generation, that we would not have a vision for five years or 10 years, but for 50 years, that when we think about what it means to, to win at life, that we would look at our children and our grand, grandchildren gathered at our feet, grateful for the tradition and legacy of faith that we've been given and that has been passed on and the tradition and legacy of, of freedom that, that our children and grandchildren can enjoy. Lord, I pray that our work would lend itself to a deeply biblical Christ-centered vision for the freedom of the family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Next week, we're reading what? Freedom not freedom on X? How do you say it? Freedom what are we reading? Yeah. Freedom, freedom on X. Yeah. For a month. Good. So, Nick, really you're good. welcome to come back if you want to talk some. Otherwise, I'll be seeing all of you later. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Ellis. Thank you.